Hello, everyone, and welcome back for another episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. The Outdoor Adventure Series celebrates individuals and families, businesses, and organizations that seek out and promote the exploration, stewardship, conservation, and access of the outdoors. Our guest today is Matthew Dickerson. Matthew is a freelance outdoor writer. His interests include cold water fisheries, fly fishing, river ecology, and conservation. He is the chair of the education committee for the Outdoor Writers Association of America. He is also a board member of OA. And in his spare time, I can't imagine he has any spare time, he is a professor at Middlebury College in Vermont. Matt, it's always a pleasure to uh, chat with you, especially when you're on the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. I know you've, you've won some awards with OWAA with this podcast, so I feel honored that I get to be a part of it. Well, uh, thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. And, and I have to say this past year in Gulf Shores, there was a lot of tough competition. And I, I know you've had your share of interviews. There's a lot of them up on, on YouTube, and we'll, we'll share the, uh, your link to your YouTube channel later. But I have to say, I think podcasting is starting to become more mainstreamish for an organization like the OWAA because sure. there's just everything from conservation to uh, to to angling, whether it's on lakes in the rivers that that you uh, enjoy out into the the open water, and so it's just really there's a lot of stiff competition and a lot of great opportunities to meet some phenomenal outdoor writers and producers there. So again. By the way, your photo that, and our listeners, you're going to see a photo behind Matt. I would love to be there, uh, wherever that is. This is in Camp May uh, National Park. Um, I've been going there very regularly while I was working on my latest book. Um, I was going there very regularly since 2015, mostly trying to go to more out-of-the-way rivers, uh, less crowded rivers, and um, doing some fly fishing. Uh, obviously for some many different species of trout and salmon. Um, but this was actually my first time this year going to the famous uh, Brooks River and Brooks Camp and Brooks Falls um, Bear View it, where they're currently holding the Fat Bear Week competition. The Fat Bear this, Week. Yeah. So this is Brooks Brooks Falls. There were four big browns here while I was there. I think oh, I moved, okay. uh, see, I see. A I see more it. of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's it like now? Were you observing or were you actually fly fishing at the same time as the bears were on their feasting? Both. I went with my wife and then also with a couple friends and we spent some time just sitting right where, where this photo is watching the bears at the falls. And that's actually um, within a certain distance. It might be 200 yards. I actually forget um, of that falls is close to fishing. Okay. Um, but then uh, I did get into the river few hundred yards downstream of this point and was fishing and was fishing in the middle of the bears and on multiple occasions had to um, fairly, uh, you don't run, you don't splash panic, but I would say um, with a determined pace, clear out of the river and make way for bears who wanted to fish my spot. I, I don't imagine you're going to argue with a bear. And, no, yeah. and, and you, you actually have to go through a safety training before you can fish there, and they give you a lot of rules. Like if you have a fish on and a bear approaches, you have to break that fish off. And I would say the most painful moment for me was I had just spotted probably the biggest rainbow trout I had seen all day. It was one of those fish in the upper 20, 20 inches, 27 to 30 inch fish, mm -hmm. standing in the shallows and just zeroing in on a cast that would drop a fly by it without getting the log. And all of a sudden, one of the big bears just steps out of shore right where that rainbow trout was. Oh, boy. And so I never did get to cast for it. And so you have to reel that fly right back in. Oh, yeah. You pull your line in. And if you're snagged or even on a fish, you break it off and you get out of the water. Okay. Now yeah. I think I know why uh, uh, anglers take so many flies with them because oh yeah, if it's not snagging it, it's it's one of those uh, wonderful bears behind you. What you just... I'm also fishing with a five weight here, yeah, and um, occasionally because they're spawning sockeye, you a sockeye spooked swims through your line and catches itself on the back, and when you've got a ten or twelve pound sockeye hooked in the back. 
between the fan or in the tail on a big, heavy current like this, there's really no way you're going to bring that fish in. So you lose some flies on, on salmon also. Okay. One thing I'm curious about, and you've kind of just described it, your experience angling and fly fishing I mean, and practicing year after year, do you become expert or just really good or just really lucky to put that fly right where you want to put it when you're kind of casting away? Certainly there's, there's a, a mix of luck involved, but there, there's definitely also a lot of practice and a lot of experience. I think okay. um, there's kind of some, there's definitely good basic technique for, for casting a fly. And then there's all of the experience to how do you adjust that cast in different conditions, whether that means casting a little sidearm to get it under some branches or creative ways of getting a, a, a better drift when you, when just a normal mind mend isn't quite going to work when the current is really, when the current is really creative and you have to respond uh, to that. So there, there's definitely a lot of uh, technique, a lot of practice and occasionally some some luck involved as well. Okay. Now, can you share? When I'm not catching fish, okay, it's, bad, it's luck. It's bad luck. When I am catching fish, and it's skill. That's the way I like to think of it. I think that's, I think that's actually the true uh, explanation. That's just the way I, I want to think of it. That's the that's the, the juxtaposition yeah. for you. Yeah. So, Alaska. I mean, it's a, such a. I mean, it, the area of Alaska. It's huge. But why this Bristol Bay area? Why? What what were you doing down there? Is this like I always wanted no. to fish this river? It, no. I mean, what first brought me there? Well, my first trip uh, to, to the Bristol Bay region was in 20, to, in 2003 with my father. And he was okay. getting older. And I wanted to be able to do just a, a really significant, what I thought at the time, once in a lifetime trip with my father to do a six-day float down a river while he was still able to do that. But I think even within a few years of that, he would not have been able to take the trip. But okay. what started me going back regularly beginning in 2015 was initially learning about and writing about the proposed pebble mine, which has been on the news for, for a decade. Right. And I, and I wanted to spend time um, on a couple of the rivers that come right out of ground zero of that proposed mine. And I was interviewing people, a, a range of people from geologists to biologists to people who make their living in the area from the fishing industry uh, and, and trying to get a sense of what their opinions were, the native peoples who, who have been living on that land for millennia. So that's really what initially brought me there. But then it turns out there's a lot more stories than just one particular mine there's you know, been proposed um dams in the bristol bay area for hydroelectric climate change is certainly having an impact on the area the caribou herd just even the last eight years or 10 years has really collapsed in that area so there's a lot of really interesting stories and also really positive stories tremendous stories of, of abundance and diversity um, especially among sockeye, which are really the keystone species for that whole ecosystem. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, yeah. it's the most important so wild salmon water in the world. 50% of the world's sockeye harvest comes from Bristol Bay, the Bristol Bay drainage, and 30% of the entire world's wild salmon harvest comes from Bristol Bay. So it's an environmentally really, really important area, as well as being a very beautiful, beautiful one. So that's a lot of what motivated me to start going there. Okay. Now, the book that you was just published, and for our listeners, I, I'm going to do my best to pronounce the name of this book without uh, Matt's assistance, Selva Linus, the, the Sockeye and the Egg-Sucking Leech. That's, that's an incredible name for a book. That's going to like bring you right in there. But tell us more about the book that was just published. Congratulations, by the way. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I've been working on it since, uh, really since 2015. Okay. Um, the title Salvalinus comes from a genus of three native fish, fish to the region that we more commonly call char. Okay. And the, the three native species of Salvalinus that you'd find in Bristol Bay would include um, lake trout, 
and then really much more specific to to that area, Arctic char and Dolly Varden char, or some people call it Dolly Varden trout. And um, though, especially the Dolly Varden is a fish I really fell in love with. I think they're the most beautiful freshwater fish in the world. So there was certainly an, an emotional attachment there in the name of the book. But sockeye salmon, as I already mentioned, are, are, are just so vitally important to the whole region. I mean, the whole ecosystem really seems to evolve, evolve around the nutrients that sockeye salmon bring up into that, into that watershed and landscape year after year after year. Ocean-borne nutrients coming into the freshwater ecosystem through spawning salmon. To yeah. everything that seems to be directly or indirectly related on the millions of fish that come up in there. I I never thought about the the impact and in the and in the, in the the trans transit of nutrients via the sockeye. Yes, because I, I, I know they go back to their original spawning grounds. They make their yeah, way over up. ninety over ninety percent of them seem to go back to to their to where their natal streams. Wow, and I never thought about the actual nutrients that they're bringing with them. So without the sockeye, that, that that's going to would climate change on its own is a is a huge issue. But yep. without those sockeye providing the nutrients along that journey back to their original spawning yeah. grounds. That would have a major impact on the whole ecosystem, the rivers coming down into Bristol Bay. Yeah. So I mean, it, it's obviously all the animals that feed directly on them, right? Mm -hmm. You have the, the brown bears, the mm -hmm. black bears, wolves are known to feed on them, all the, the bird life. But then these animals carry those, those nutrients out into the soil, um, mm -hmm. either not just dragging the salmon carcasses out and you have these half-eaten salmon carcasses providing nutrients. But of course, they all defecate, right? The old humorous question, does a bear poop in the woods? The, the answer is yes. And all over the tundra true and pretty much everywhere it goes. And when it's doing that, it's defecating out uh, ocean-borne nutrients. And, yeah. and, and, I, and I, I, it's, it's probably too early for me to remember uh, n another uh, OA member uh, wrote a book about uh, bears, bears and trees and the nutrients uh, that are found even in the trees of salmon yes. because of that, that very thing there, because you don't think of the bears taking these carcasses right. and eating them and then pooping them out miles away. And it's like, and everything just kind of is connected. It's just like one big system. And in uh, Absolutely. Everything is connected. I mean, every, everything, everything is downstream of everything else, right? Meta, literally, there's one direction in a river that's downstream, but metaphorically, um, we all live downstream of everything. And because it's not just that the terrestrial and river ecosystems are dependent on the ocean borne nutrients from the salmon, but the whole ocean ecosystem, right? In that area. Mm -hmm. It's dependent on the salmon, which feed everything else in the ocean, right? They're, they're feeding sharks and seals and sea lions and whales. Mm -hmm. But without the, the protected rivers, those salmon wouldn't be spawning and the oceans wouldn't have that food source. Mm -hmm. So the, the rivers are dependent on the ocean-borne fish and the oceans are dependent on those protected, protected rivers. It's just so tightly, as you said, tightly interwoven and, inter, and interconnected. That's amazing. I, I'm curious too. Uh, you started the book uh, back in 2015, and again, it's just recently been completed and it's published. Is it uh, why the this length of time? I mean, I, I, look, George R. R. Martin can't even finish his latest second to last novel, but why did why did this book take longer uh, than perhaps another one you might you might have written? Well, a few reasons. One, of course, is the Bristol Bay drainage is, is absolutely huge. Like I could, I could spend a hundred lifetimes writing this book and not cover, cover that. I mean, just, just one of the national parks I spent time in, Lake Clark National Park is the size of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. Katmai National Park in the Bristol Bay drainage, most of it is in the Bristol Bay drainage, is also the size of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Wood Tick Chick State Park, most of which is in this drainage, I think actually all of Wood Tick Chick is in the drainage, is the largest state park in the world. 
So there's a tremendous amount of land and rivers. So there's no way I could write a book about all of Bristol Bay. What I was trying to do is just find a few like snapshots, a few iconic places that would capture the sense of it. So it's partly just a scope. There's a lot to learn. I inter you know, I interviewed a lot of people. So I was continuously learning and continuously trying to um, figure out how to tell the story. And it's not my full-time job. I couldn't say, I can't, I teach at a college and I do other writing and I've got novels that I've been working on. So part of it is just a little bit of my time being divided. Okay. And I did have one earlier book that, that some of the stories of these trips appeared in. I had an earlier book called The Voices of Rivers and um, really that focused on non-fly fishing. Um, it was still about rivers and trout and ecology with a little bit of fly fishing, but some of the non-fly fishing centric writing went in there. And I wrote a lot of magazine articles about the area. So it's a lot of my writing has been coming out for the last eight years, but this book really did take a, it took, it took a long time. I, I learned a lot. I was learning right up until the last month of writing. And I interviewed one of the key salmon biologists um, in, in that region and uh, learned a lot from him that's still, still very late to writing this book, ended up playing an important role in, in how I framed the stories. As you completed this book and as you look back over the the journey uh, from start or, or it, what informed you to want to write the book, the process of writing it and now seeing it up on the shelf, is there a, one or two stories, takeaways that you, know, you look back and you just say, wow, yeah, this is unbelievable? Yeah. There's a few. I think. I think one is I was really fortunate in one way when I, I took the trip in 2003. And when I, then when I went back to really begin working seriously on the book in 2015, the guy that I knew from that 2003 was no longer working there. So I was looking for a, a new sort of home base, a, a potential lodge guy person that I could really get to know and, and spend some time with. And, um, I guess this was one of the cases where it wasn't skill. It was just, it was just fortune. I almost accidentally got, uh, just looking online, look, trying to, trying to get a sense for, for different lodges, just, just stumbled on a, a place called the farm lodge. I think it's recently been rebranded or, uh, as Lake Clark resort, but the, the key figure there is, was Glenn Allsworth Jr. He's actually the grandson of the, of the person who the town is named after, the town of Port Allsworth, where the headquarters of Lake Clark National Park is. Um, I just met Glenn Allsworth Jr. And he's, a, he's a, pi a bush pilot, a lodge owner, a fishing guide, um, and a wonderful human being. And he's lived his whole life in this little off-the-grid village of 180 people. His whole life has been in this landscape, flying over it day after day after day. He's just so well connected in the area. And his father and his grandfather are connected, or grandfather was connected to the region. Um, both his father and grandfather are famous um, aviators. And so a, a part of it was just getting to meet Glenn and, and hearing his stories and seeing the love he has for the place and knowledge he has for the place and how much fun he was to spend time with. And so I think that relationship was key. And then um, later in the, in, the, uh, in the process, really my very last trip before finishing the book in 2022, uh, got to spend time with one of the salmon biologists who's who's really a key figure in that area. He spends every summer teaching and doing research, uh, looking at over 50 years of longitudinal data on salmon in the Bristol Bay area. And so he just got to sit down, spend time with them, read some of his articles. And he really gave me a much deeper sense of just how tremendously diverse and abundant that ecosystem is and how important that diversity is um, even within the sockeye salmon species, there's tremendous genetic diversity in how big they are, how tall they are, how red they grow, um, what the, um, even how big their eggs are. Like different, different sockeye salmon lay eggs 
actually of different sizes and they're genetically fine tuned to little streams. Yeah, I mean, I mean to, to very small regions, not to little streams, but to little areas, to small areas. And so, for example, the ones that spawn in these little, little streams with very fine gravel, they have to have smaller eggs to drop down into the gravel and the, the sockeye that are genetically attuned to the bigger rivers with larger gravel, they have larger eggs, heavier eggs. It'll sink down and into those holes. And so he said there's over 60 different genetic variations within the sockeye species that enable them to finally attune or finally adapt to a very local region. Um, that, that's so, amazing. Yeah. And what that means is it means if like, one river had, if like you have a really dry year and a small stream, it's just a bus for the stream. There's just not enough river, not enough water in that stream for the socket to spawn. So you have a, a really dry year. Some other stream, the conditions are perfect. Mm. Or you're really rainy year. Some of the bigger rivers are not going to be really good or some of the steeper gradient rivers aren't going to be good. But some of the flatter streams that might be too warm in some years are really going to thrive. And so if you have a bust year, one year, you have a boom year, one, one place, you have a boom the same year in a different place. And so the system as a whole can really thrive. And that, that tremendous diversity among the species and among all the different waters and the fact that they haven't been developed, that they've been so protected is so key to why that region is still thriving in the, in the sockeye population and why they can harvest a lot. I mean, there's a tremendous harvest and still allowing the salmon populations to thrive and, and, and even be increasing. I have a whole new appreciation when I go to the local stores because the, the salmon I eat is almost all sockeye salmon. Yeah. I, I stay away from farm raised. Yes. And the, <laughs> and I, I think what you're, you're painting a picture of this diversity and again, the system, it's just one big system. Yeah. And also the adaptability of the system, whether it's nature or whether it's the fish themselves. If I can't go here, I'm going to go somewhere else. And yeah. it's, that's just incredible. I can only imagine how beautiful this area was. Is there, you know, a particular spot? I mean, obviously the, the photo yes. behind you is very, is wonderful. I mean, I would give anything to see that, which that might be a conversation after this podcast is over. Uh, cause I could think of another podcast, by the way, you and I could be doing this together. Um, uh, is there a particular spot in this area that, you know, you mentioned about bringing your dad to the area and, and fishing yeah. for a number of days, but is there a spot or two that just really, you get emotional about? Yeah, there, there are, of all the rivers I had a chance to visit over the years, especially with Glen Ellsworth Jr. and the, and the farm lodge, my stays at the farm lodge. All the different rivers he brought me to and lakes and, and flights. There were two that are still really close in my heart. Not necessarily where I caught the most fish or the biggest fish, but where the landscape is just so breathtaking. Like every time I'm, I fly over and every time our little plane lands and I get out of the plane, it's like, it's this moment. I, I, it almost brings tears to my eyes. It's, it's. To say it would be pretty, even to say it's beautiful would be an understatement. It's just sublime. It's just absolutely breathtaking. And the, then the fact that I can get out and walk this landscape and catch fish mm -hmm. or not catch fish because I'm sitting on a hillside waiting for five bears to get off the river. Mm -hmm. It just makes it so much more special. One of them I'm not going to mention. You'll have to go. <laughs> I don't want to give up. That's okay. Glenn doing your spots. You'd have to go book a trip with them and let him bring you there. All right. But I will say that the, one of the rivers I fished that's, that's headwaters comes out of the whole Pebble Mine area is one of those rivers that I've always found particularly beautiful and, and special to be on. I, I could imagine, like, I'm, I'm a morning coffee guy. I love my cup of coffee in the yeah. morning. And as I share with friends, it's a glass mug. Yeah. And Howard, why a glass mug? Well, I want to see good coffee. And I yeah. could imagine a mug of coffee with this beautiful landscape in front of me, this wonderful day that's about to yeah. take place, whether it's hiking or fishing or just sitting and watching. And then as the sun sets and the, you know, dusk and you enjoy your beverage of choice, yeah. just kind of thinking about what just occurred today. 
I, I'm thinking there's a lot of stories there, a lot of books. So. Oh, yeah. There's a lot. I mean, I've already, as I said, I've already gotten two books out of this and a lot of magazine articles. Yeah, I mean, the the, the lodge where I go to, the farm lodge, sits on, on Lake Clark in Lake Clark National Park in this little village at Fort Allsworth. And so I love just sitting on the porch on the deck of the lodge with my coffee in the morning. And in September, which is my favorite time to go, you're beginning to get snow-covered peaks around you. So the view is beautiful. But then I also get a, I always get a second coffee in a thermos. And you can't bring your glass mug in the airplane because it'll end up with the coffee, maybe some of it on your lap. There. But I bring a, I will then bring a thermos on the airplane. And there's just something special. It's often about a 45-minute flight to the fishing in the morning. And I'm just, just sitting there holding the thermos, just looking out, breath, I mean, a wordlessly looking out of the plane windows at the landscape below me. And the other thing I try to do is I, I keep trying to find some stream or river, either we're in the landscape that Glenn can't tell me what the name is and something about it. I've, I've never succeeded. You can fly over river after river after river and say, okay, what's that one there? And they'll tell me something about it. That's amazing. It's, well, just growing up in that area, it's, uh, yeah. It's, that is wonderful. And, and just to be able to give that back and be so passionate about it. And, yeah. and by the way, you get to tell the story. So that's, yeah. that's, that's equally special. Actually, Think let me tell you one story that I, you asked about something that brought this home to me. Sure. So Dan Schindler, the biologist that I was telling you, he's just the University of Washington. I think he heads up their salmon research program. And he was telling me that female sockeye will always pick the tallest and reddest male to mate with, right? So just, just having that big high, a high hump, like the big high hump in the back and a bright red color. They, that's what they're looking for. So for some reason, that big, big hump um, is, a, is a benefit to, to reproduction. But he said in some of the shallow streams, the t- really tall sockeye can't actually get up. They tip over. They're so tall that they get into like three inches of water. And they're flopping over on their side. They can't swim up it. And the less tall sockeye, the ones that don't have that big hump on them, are the ones that successfully mate because they're the ones who can swim up. Ah. He tells me that story. and I'm trying to mentally picture, picture it. And just three days later, I'm standing at a little stream. Up in the bushes, higher up the stream, there are two pairs of sockeye, sockeye one male and one female. And I notice that both of the males are much sleeker, much more torpedo shaped. They don't have that big pancake flat hump. And they're up where the spawning is, paired up with females. I go downstream 300 yards and I realize there's this big shallow gravel area that's only like two inches deep. And there's this big old humped, humpbacked sockeye that can't get up through there. And when I walk down to the water, I, I, I inadvertently or unintentionally spooked it. It tries to swim up there. It gets like 10 yards up and it falls over and it's flopping down. And then the current just flops it back to where it was. And I thought here was like an absolute perfect illustration of what uh, Professor or Dr. Schindler had just been telling me three days earlier about genetic differences between sockeye that give them advantages or disadvantages depending on where their natal streams. Wow. I mean, it's, it brings it all home. Yeah. Before we head out for today, I, I want to just acknowledge your involvement with the, the Outdoor Writers Association of America. You are on the board. You've been on the board for a number of years now. This is my third and final term. Yep. On the third board. and final term. And you're also the, the chair of the education committee. So yes. I'm curious about that. I'm, I, for our listeners, I was involved with the Excellence in Craft Committee. I was chair yep. of the awards committee. Uh, this this past year or this year, and I, I'm curious about the education committee and what the responsibilities of that assignment is. Yeah, so we, we mostly um most of our work is with high school and college age people. So we administer a um a scholarship for college students in or students getting ready to go to college in um. Any sort of environmental, I mean, sorry, outdoors communication field. Mm-hmm. So people who want to study journalism with uh, emphasis in the outdoors, creative writing with an emphasis in the outdoors, filmmaking, podcasting, blogging, any, any college student who's seriously 
pursuing some sort of outdoor communication field. There's um, some scholarship there. And then the big thing we run is a photography and writing competition. Mm -hmm. It's actually four competitions, one for photography, one for writing, and then for college age and high school students where they can, you can submit, submit a piece, it gets judged and there are you know, cash prizes and then the winning ones get published in the OWAA's Outdoors Unlimited magazine. Excellent. So I, part of what we do is help get the word out about the competition um, and then handle the judging of both the competition and the scholarship. That's wonderful. And how long has this particular uh, scholarship been around? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I've only been a member of OWAA since 2014 and it was, it was around in 2014. So actually I should know the history of it, but I, I don't. It's been changed a little bit. So the previous um, chair of the, of the committee realized, I think, that we might, we might have better success attracting people and get better writing if, if we shifted from middle school and, and high school to high school and college. So that was a shift that my predecessor made, which I think has been really good because we've gotten some really good applications from college students. And then, um, and the, then we've also shifted from poetry and prose to pros and photography, because there's a lot of interest in photography. We've also thought about maybe some other catalog, uh, categories potentially in the future, like film, short, short videos. We could also do students who do podcasting or something else. So, but right now we have two, two competitions. Very good. Very good. And I, it's always good to learn about other aspects of what's going on uh, in the organization. Matt, before we head out, we've got two segments on our show. One is the aha moment. And, the, and for that segment, as you kind of look back in the work that you have been doing, and you've mentioned just the experience of writing the book over these many years, since 2015, and just the importance of the, the Bristol Bay and, and the drainage and the whole eco ecosystem. What's your aha moment for the work that you've been doing, especially the impact that you're potentially having through your writing and also your own education yourself. What's been your aha moment as a, re as a result of kind of spending a lot of nice, good times in this area? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think there have been a few and some of them are, are continuous. Certainly every time I'm standing on a stream or a river and I see a brown bear grabbing a salmon out of the water. And they have so many different fishing techniques, like different bears have their own little techniques that they're good at. But every time, no matter how I catch it, I see one um, grabbing a salmon out of the river, ripping it open and eating the eggs. And then five minutes later, I'm walking pie a pile out of the, on the tundra of the remains of their meal a few hours earlier. It's just this very visceral, visceral reminder um, of how interwoven and tightly connected the whole ecosystem is, how everything is so important, how the conservation of that land is so important to so many cultures and so many, so many ecosystems. And then, uh, and then whether I'm on the shore looking down from a bluff or flying in the airplane and looking down and you see maybe a hundred yard stretch of river that is so full of salmon, you don't even see the bottom. All you see in the river is this bright red smudge of water that might be 100, 200 yards long. And you begin to get a sense for how thick and how abundant those fish are and what a difference they make. Mm -hmm. Like you say, well, what difference can one fish make in an ecosystem by getting eaten? Well, they're probably not much, but when you have millions of them, and even in a small stream, thousands or tens of thousands of them, there is so much out there. And it's just, Again, breath, breathtaking to see that amount of uh, abundance and resilience. At the same time, there's a certain fragility as well. You realize that um, one dam, one major dam could have a huge dramatic uh, negative impact. One big mine could have an impact. Um, the collapse of the, of the caribou herd um, in the, in the Nushigat, the Nushigat caribou herd is another reminder of how 
fragile and changing this is. So it's just this amazing mix of abundance, diversity on the one hand, and also a certain amount of uh, fragility on the other. As you were describing it, those were the two dichotomies I was thinking yes. about. Abundance, like adaptability, fragil uh, being the, the, and the fragile nature of it. I, yeah. I love that. Thank you. Before before we uh, head out, the last segment is our insight to go. And I'd love, is there a final quote, uh, a book, an article you want to draw our listeners' attention to that, that kind of just leave them with that, that little gift about, again, your experiences and what you've been learning and perhaps some advice to them if they want to embark on a career, uh, whether it's in higher education or writing or conservation, stewardship, what, what would be your insight to go to them? Well, my, I think my ecological insight would come from a really beautifully written book by Robin Wall Kimmerer titled Braiding Sweet Glass, Grass. One of the central themes, one of the repeated mantras that come in that book is all flourishing is mutual. All flourishing is mutual. When you help the landscape to flourish, when you help the bears to flourish, when you help the trees to flourish, you're helping everything else to flourish. When you help the world, you know, what we want to call nature, rivers to flourish, we're helping humankind, you know, to flourish. So all flourishing is mutual, which is another way of saying everything lives downstream. And, um, and again, if I were to give some little advice to people who want to write, I think the most important thing we can we can begin to do and learn to do is be attentive, to be still, to be quiet, to listen, to look. And that sort of engaged attentiveness is so often busy in our fast-paced, social media-driven world where we're constantly distracted by 10 different things at once. We're being texted and we're being messaged and we're watching TikTok videos and we're we're doing all these different things at once. We're distracted by so many things. And I think that's one of the things that's really counterproductive to the deeper knowledge and insights of the outdoors. Some of the insights didn't come from necessarily reading a book or from a quick glance. They came from just sitting, being quiet, listening, and being attentive to everything around you. And you begin to see those relationships and the ways that, um, you know, we're all interconnected. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And we will provide a backlink to Robin Wall Kimmerer's uh, book, uh, Burning Sweetgrass. Finally, if our listeners would like to learn more about you and your work, where are the best places for them to go? Well, I mean, my, certainly my, I think my um, couple more recent books, um, the one you already mentioned, The Salvalinus, The Sockeye, and The Egg Second Leech. My book before that was about uh, native cutthroat in the ecology of the Northern Rocky Mountains. And the clear cut, the cut, I mean, sorry, that was a, a magazine article. Oh, oh my goodness, uh, the name, I'm, I'm, all I'm thinking about is the name of my article, the, uh, the <laughs> name of the book. Um, uh, a Fine Spotted Trout in Corral Creek. Right. And then my book, The Voices of Rivers. I also do have a, a YouTube channel called uh, Trout Downstream and Heart Streams, and I think there's a link to it. Okay that I gave you um, that has some videos about some of these things and, and more to come. And so even if you don't want to listen to my rambling voice, you're listening to me talk, you can just turn the volume off and enjoy the, the scenery of rivers and fish and other creatures. Perfect. Well, we'll provide all the backlinks, uh, which will be live links uh, to the books as well as to the website and your social channels, especially the, uh, the YouTube channel and, uh, I very rarely uh, watch TV anymore. It's all YouTubes because I, I, it's a great way to consume and get educated. So I mm -hmm. truly appreciate that. Matt, as uh, usual, it's a pleasure to have you on the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. And I really uh, appreciative of the fact we can catch up like this and see what yeah. you have been up to. And uh, I'm sorry we were, we were not together in uh, Gulf Shores, but I know our conversations will continue hopefully in person. Yeah. Well, uh, either fly, learning how to fly fish for me or enjoying a cup of coffee in the morning. But uh, it's always a pleasure to have you join us on the podcast. Yeah, so thanks thank for you. having me. And uh, maybe in 11 months, um, I'm hoping to make the next OWAA uh, national gathering down in um, in Texas. In yeah, El Paso. El Paso. Yeah, looking forward to it.
All right. I see. And I'm already thinking about how do I get up to Alaska with you, but that's a whole other conversation. So yeah, well, we can follow up on that one easily. Sounds good. Listen, stay in the quick line. We're going to do a quick close and you and I can have a final chat. Okay. Okay. All right, folks. We've just been chatting with Matthew Dickerson, freelance outdoor writer, trout and fly fishing enthusiast. Uh, Really uh, today's episode, really kind of talking about just his uh, latest uh, projects, which have all involved or mostly involved uh, being up in Alaska and in, in the Bristol Bay area, then talking about the rivers and the streams that feed in uh, to Bristol Bay. And his latest book, uh, The Salvalinus, The Sockeye and the Egg Sucking Leech, that is just an incredible title. We're going to have a backlink to it. I appreciate uh, some of the stories that Matt shared about the writing of the book and the journey to write the book. And also some of the experiences, the these lodges, uh, the scientists that are studying the the sockeye, and the spe- and really just the the whole ecology of this area, and just a, definitely a great learning episode. And we hope you enjoyed it uh, as much as I did, and because Matt's always a, a a great guest and just really some wonderful stories and uh, just very accomplished in in, in his field, and so. We're going to have backlinks to all of the, the books uh, on our website. The, again, uh, Salvalinus. Uh, we also have this earlier book, The Finds A Fine Spotted Trout on Coral Creek, and also The Voices of Rivers. And we'll have links back to his web and social sites as well. As for us, you can find us on the Outdoor Adventure Series uh, page.com. We're also on Facebook and LinkedIn. We also have our YouTube channel, Outdoor Adventure Series. And you can find us on all of the podcast directories. If you happen to listen on Apple or uh, Spotify, we would love, or even on our website for that matter, leave us a comment. If you're on the uh, Spotify or Apple, give us those five stars so we can uh, continue to share the great uh, episodes that we are producing. Uh, With regard to the whole outdoors and the adventure, the conservation, stewardship, and exploration. Okay, folks, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, go out there and have a phenomenal day, and we will see you on a future episode of the Outdoor Adventure Series podcast. Take care.